your call? Yep. And, um, and I'm still working on it. So Chuck said he had a USB C to uh, whatever so adapter. Really so, you know, you just yeah, I'll talk uh, about it. Uh, 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 either one works. The USB C. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That works for me. But these are very sensitive. It's all good. I can speak with whatever you give me as long as it's a microphone. Can you turn it on? Please. Yeah. I use, I use so let's double check and just Probably talk. Anything which I'm going to is the most useless phrase in the history of microphones. And I'm talking, talking, I'm saying words, 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 how level can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Anybody in the back? Yes? Yes. Good? All right. You can hear me in the hallway. I gave you that one. Actually, we can get it that way. <laughs> what uh, What did you name? A USB-C, a USB-C to whatever the projector is. Yep. Chuck said he had something, so. Just on the off chance that they're not able to find the adapter. Does anybody in the crowd have a USB C to HDMI adapter that I can borrow for about a 45 minutes? Yes? Okay. I'm always a fan of making backup plans. The one I brought didn't work, neither did the backup. So make sure I'll break the three and all three fail too. That's why I had two, because last year my adapter failed too. So
theoretically good. I mean, as soon as our recording person comes back, it'll be good. We got one from the crowd if you want to come back. Let's go ahead and get recording. We got one from the crowd, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get recording and we can get started. It's automatic. Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and get started. Uh, everyone, welcome to the 2019 South East Learning Fest here in Charlotte. If it's your first time, welcome. And we're just going to go on now. My name is Robert Marshall, and I am a distribution engineer at GitLab. Uh, I started off 20 years ago. I was a web developer. I tripped my way into being a Kimball data architect. Go all the way down to the bottom of the pool and hit the, uh, the bootloader stack. Worked on Grub2 for a while. And now I do distribution. And what this is, in a nutshell, is taking all the work by the folks that write the GitLab package, which is everything that makes it soup to nuts, package it up, and make it easy for you to install. That's Omnibus, that's Cognitive Charts. And that's kind of why we're here. Now, just to get a quick feel, how many folks here have used Kubernetes for longer than six months? Two. Okay. Three. So I see three total. So let's go ahead and let's get rolling. Now, like all good talks, it started with a simple fix, right? All we're trying to do is add mirroring of remote repositories to GitLab and the Cloud Native Charts. We're trying to put in feature parity. Um, if you want to know more about that journey, there's a great talk that was given by Jason Plum, who was one of the other engineers on my team. It's called From Monolith to Microservices. Pitchfork's not included. That was given here at the Southeast Linux Fest last year. He also gave it at KubeCon, I believe, in Copenhagen. So just, if you go onto YouTube and take a look, you can find it again. His name is Jason Flum. But so we're going to go on and talk about the initial issue. So this is what we got. I said, hey, I tried to do this, and I just, I see that SSH and it says key scan, but they're not in the containers, right? So can we just add those? And we go, sure. Not a problem, we'll add those. Except it didn't actually fix things. Now this is one of the other team members I work with. And he said, well, I did this, and it just, it just, it didn't work, right? Now remember, we're in the cloud. So if we're going to go way back to 2009, and what is the cloud, right? Here's a lovely quote from Mark Benioff. This is very aspirational. We work where the rubber meets but the road. we don't work in aspirations. <laughs> we work where the rubber meets the road. And um, since Kubernetes is shaping up to be the operating system of the cloud, well, we have our command line tools, right? This is what we talked about. Now, Cube Control, and if people want to argue how to pronounce that, we'll have a version of another session where we can talk about it. This comes up every time I've ever seen Kubernetes talk about, but I call Cube Control. And that's how we talk to our, our cluster, and that's why this talk is when everything is a cluster, because we're working Kubernetes, right? No jokes. <clears throat> um, and Helm is our package manager. Now, I know there are other things out there. This is what a lot of folks use. This is what we use at GitLab, so that's our package manager. And then, if you work with Kubernetes, you're just getting into it. These two tools are for you, so kubectx and kubeNS. And what these do for you, if you work with a lot of clusters, which I have on average seven or eight at any given time, or in multiple namespaces, which I have multiple set up at any time, this lets you get through and work faster. Because you can say, I'm working with this specific cluster with a short command, I'm going to be in this namespace for right now. And if you've done it through the cube control command, which is basically it's cube, config, context, it's this long, long, long string. You don't want to type it. It's much better to say kubectx self 2019. So here's our cloud native. Much, much easier switching, right? So here's our cloud native tools. And this lets us know what's going on inside of a cluster. Now, since there's a lot of folks in here who are new to Kubernetes, it looks like, this is what a Kubernetes cluster actually looks like. And this is taken directly from the Kubernetes.io website and their overview of the operation of Kubernetes with a, uh, with a CCM, which is a cloud control module. Now, here's the thing. This basically, how many people have been doing system administration work for longer than a decade? How many of you have piles of shell scripts to be dragged around from job to job and set things up and automate them for you? Kubernetes replaces all of that. So this nice architecture is a drawing that we've tried to do on our own. 
But this is thousands of us trying to just do it once and be done because we're all sick of carting around our shell scripts and hoping they continue to be portable, right? So if this is our, our operating system, right, and we're going to mirror, well, we need to set it up to work. So our application, we're going to say, okay, we go into the mirroring section of our repository setup. We generate a public and private key to mirror. So let's head and see, can we reproduce the problem? Now this is in the UI, right? Whenever you want to try and do a problem, you go to the application, the command line, you say, can I reproduce the issue? And here it is, and there's the error message. When we try and mirror, this is what's being reported after we added SSH into the container. Now I'm going to back up for a second and ask one more quick question. I know there's only three folks that raised their hands when they said they're using Kubernetes for more than six months. Is everyone, uh, is everyone on board with this idea that if we go back to this, that what's going on here is we're taking containers, define, you know, define containers, and we're running them basically on Kubernetes, which is basically a cloud OS. The containers are running inside that. Are we all comfortable with that? Does anybody have a question or have a... Okay. I just want to make sure, because that's kind of important as we go along, that we're dealing with containers. Now, that's our, that is our, our problem. So let's go to the command line. Git logs, right? We're going to look at the git lead pod, and a pod is basically, it's a single unit of work that has containers in it. And this is what we're looking at, and I know that it's in git because git is something we've written to make a service out of talking to the git file system. Now, when we look at that, we get this. That's the output from the log. Okay, awesome. There's a lot up there, but there's uh, something a little familiar. I almost got deja vu looking at that. So let's, look, let's look at this again. It's the exact same message. So that's great. I, I do not think more. I've used my command line tool for the cloud operating system, right? Because Kubernetes is the OS of the cloud. We know nothing. That is useless, uselessly consistent, right? I mean, it's, it's there, it's useful, but it's not useful to us to troubleshoot this. And, but here's the thing, how many people have a complex web application they support? A couple folks? Do you log 100% of everything it does? No, right, like this, is, like this thing that's uselessly use consistent is not a knock on the application. It's just, if we logged everything, we lose all performance, right? There are some things you can't, you just, you know, you don't do. So what do we do if we don't see it in the logs from the pods, which is the output from the containers that run the application, right? We're kind of in a lost state. So the application is now the dreaded black box. We have no idea because the logs aren't telling us, and the behavior on the UI is telling us the same thing. So what are we going to do? Well, as an admin, we're used to saying, well, what about the powers of observation? What can we see? What can we observe? But it's in the cloud, right? We don't have our usual tools, do we? Well, just remember that the cloud is, and this is my favorite sticker, I have this at home. The cloud is just somebody else's computer, right? So we, we really don't need to panic. And this is when I talk to folks about Kubernetes and what they're doing. This is where most folks, it's kind of like the brain checks out, it's the cloud, it's different. No, it's just somebody else's computer, right? And this is from 2015, so this is about give or take six years after that quote I put up earlier, right? It took six years for someone to come up with this and kind of make it popular. So at least this is my first time I saw it come up. So there are some caveats here, right? Container has to be based on a Linux distribution. Now, what does that mean? That means it's based on Alpine, Debian Slim. Uh, you pick what you want. Uh, if you're new to containers, there's a thing called a bare container where you can put, like, say, just Golang or just an, uh, a, an operating file in there, and there's no uh, distribution or core subsystem under there at all. It's just a container with your operating code nothing else. That is outside the scope of what we're talking about. They exist, but not very many people are doing that that I've seen. Okay? And also, are your favorite tools installed? So, I mean, you can be wild and put S-Trace in there, it's kind of heavy, but HTOP, LSOP should be in there, IOTOP, right? All of your favorite tools from diagnosing stuff in you know, Linux are all inside of your container, provided you've installed one of these, you know, a Linux distro that has it. And then, of course, 
you know, the container has to be able to have that extra load, right? Because for those of you who are, who are running with Kubernetes, you know that you have plenty of extra resources, that your cloud is not constrained at all, and that it costs nothing to just scale everything up. It doesn't add to your bills monthly at all, right? So, you know, can your container take that extra work? And I'm going to talk about just some assumptions I made when crafting this talk. I'm going to assume that you have some knowledge of Linux, some knowledge of containers, and then you have some experience troubleshooting. Now, if none of these apply to you, that's okay. Just raise your hand, ask a question. It's how we all learn, right? There's no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb question is the one you didn't ask, right? So ask away. I can take it. So, with this said, wouldn't it be great if we could just watch the black box like we would an application, right? Well, oddly enough. How many folks here knew about the watch utility? Oh, hey. We can. How many folks here knew about the watch utility in Linux before I just put up their own screen? This is actually something I had never used. Okay, good number, about half the crowd. So, this is actually something I had never used before, believe it or not. And a good friend of mine said, well, why don't you just use watch? Use what? Use watch. And this lets us watch what's going on in the system. You can feed an arbitrary command. And monitor. So let's try it. So we're going to first use our cloud operating system, right? command line of the cloud, it gets our container so that we can get to where we're familiar with the Linux world. And we're going to exec into the Giddily pod. And again, if you want to know more about Giddily and how it runs and why we know to go here, right? Microser or monolith microservices, pitchfork song included by Jason Plum. We'll go into more detail on that. Uh, it's just, it's a lot of stuff. His talk is really good, and it's an hour long on just that. That's why I'm kind of deferring to that. But, so we do that, and then we watch this. Now this is watching, we're looking for the processes, and we are looking for what's going on. And we're going to search that for anything that's doing SSH. And we find this little nugget. So this, having used our, our, our watch utility, tells us that the application is trying to run this command. Okay, right? Everybody, most people here are familiar with SSH. Everybody cool what's going on here? I should mention that something else here that's going on, uh, that their strict strict host key checking is turned on in the environment by default, so it's not being passed as an option here. But that is at play in what's going on here. Now, let's pay attention to one piece of information here. This is the identity file. Now that's the file where like, you can generate your SSH public and private public keys. This is going to be your private key. Now in this instance, Giddily has stored it. We created so we created the key pair earlier. The way that works is you create the key pair and it gives you the public key. And you put that public key in the remote repository that you are going to mirror back to Giddily. That way you have connectivity. So this is how it's going to grab that. You set it in the UI and this is how it's going to grab it just from this file, generate on the fly. So, Let's see what happens when we try and do the remote from here. So we're going to do that with it, with watch. We're going to watch that temp directory with an ls, and we want to figure out what happened, right? What is going on? Okay. Well, there's directory. And this GitLab shell key file, blah, blah, blah. That is our thing, right? And you see it right there? It's there. Looks appropriate. Looks right. Okay, so this looks fine. So, what's going on, right? We see that it's making the command. We know what the environment's doing. We see the proper item up there. So, why doesn't it work? Well, like most problem solving in Linux, right? Let's read the manual, right? So, what does the manual tell us? It says, well, right? I'll let you read it for yourselves. Right? But the part we want to pay attention to I've highlighted, right? Hosts, if not found. It, it will add addresses to the destination hosts Regardless if they're not found. Regardless of your strict host key setting. Now, strict host key says only add hosts, right? Well, this only add the, ho add the hosts if you're checking the key. This will still add it. Well, this says no matter if you've said this, we're saying you can't add the hosts, this will still add it no matter what. And this is to prevent man middle attacks. So well, we don't want to mess with that. So, we've kind of found the smoking gun. We know what's going on. But this is going to confound us. Right? And do you see the problem? It's because 
this. It's read only. So it's trying to add that host key. Mode 0400. So it's trying to add that host key, and it's going, I can't, and when it can't, you get the signal, I can't connect. Now we know what's going on. We've done it purely by observation of the black box. So now we know what's going on. We've done it purely by observation of the black box. Right? You look at this and you just kind of go, right. Well, you know, now, right, it's hard to write to read only file. Right, that's all the tools we use. So, uh, that's how we got to figure it out. Right, that's all the tools we used. But the question is, what was our actual bug? And the actual bug was a little bit different. The actual bug is, when that key got created, when it tried to reconnect, it just made a new key. It didn't remember the private keys. So when it tried to write the file, it was putting a brand new key in every time, which wasn't synced. But we never would have traced it down to that without using just the old school, go to the command line, look at your black box, figure out where it's going. So what are our takeaways here? What, what do we know? Well, we know that don't panic, right? It's the cloud, but it's just somebody else's computer, right? And different places have the same faces, right? It's, all, it's mostly just Linux under the hood. Right? So if you need if you need it, Linux is Linux. Right? And know your available tools. Now, here's the thing, if you need more, figure out how to get access into the container. One of the other things I'm going to mention is not all tools should be in all containers. This is a, this is an important thing to keep in mind because some tools do provide uh, threat vectors that you don't want in your container. So consider having your basic container and then in your CI have a container that has those tools that can flow through and you can deploy to your staging cluster, your testing cluster and go, I can reproduce this now with all the tools I need, but in production I'm not putting all that baggage up there, right? It's not, and it's not just threat vector, it's, it's, it's uh, size on disk, all the other stuff going on. But figure out what tools you have and know what available tools you can use. Right? So if you have you know, 10, 20 years of Linux experience, bring it on over. It's more than welcome in the cloud. So to this point, I'm going to open up these questions. Because that's just kind of, you know, this is, that, that, that is where we're going with this, right? How to troubleshoot, what to troubleshoot. And so this is time for questions. If you run into things, there's only three folks that have six months. Is everybody in this room, is everyone at least touched Kubernetes? So Raise your hand if you haven't. Okay. So, for the folks that haven't touched Kubernetes, I'm going to ask, what would you like to know? Right? Because if you haven't touched it yet, this, is a, this whole thing about troubleshooting. So, is the, you know, if, you, this, if there's anything you want extra, now is the time. I have to start getting into it to even know what to ask. <laughs> That's fair enough. The comment was that to start getting into it, even know what to ask. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the top on the content? Yes, sir. Uh, so, how is uh, a Kubernetes container different from a process? So, the question is, how is a Kubernetes container different from a process? So, a container, a Kubernetes is running on the Linux system. So a container is basically a namespace, because now containers are C namespaced. And it's running that through the Docker run, through a container runtime. It's currently Docker, you can run it through others. But it's, the way it's different from a process is it's self-contained. So because of that C namespace, it does, it's not able to talk to other things. Now that's not to say you cannot break out of a container, okay? Because if I said that, in about three weeks, there'll be a cute little web page with a cute name in the picture saying, look! It's not completely contained. And there have been a few of those already. So, you know, it is a thing. But it's basically isolation. Okay? Where a process running just on the system is not isolated, this isolates it. The other thing is that this is scalable. Because the container can do uh, resource control. So if you say, I, let's give a good example. Let's say you're running a very large website. Okay? And you need a lot of, let's say, e-commerce. We're going to go with the basic example. And you have a lot of things you want to serve to the front end going off the database. Well, you'll want your database to we all know you need lots of the ability to read. But you also want a lot of the front end to be able to respond and to load balance across so you're not bottlenecking on that. Turn my monitor back on. And so what, a, what containers let you do is instead of a single process or threading it up, you can spread them across multiple machines. Because remember, a Kubernetes cluster 
is not just on one machine. You have a control, a control node, and then you also have multiple replicas. So you may have 40 machines of which 15 of them are running your front-end application. Okay? And that front-end application is able to, able to load balance among itself. It gets away from having to figure out your load balancing and you know, figure out your routes. It handles, Kubernetes handles all of that for you behind the scenes. So all that craziness you can be used to for trying to fail over. Um, if one of those pods goes away, which has the container in it, unlike a process where you have to like brought this, say, put a systemd unit watch or put trip water or so, whatever you use to say, I want to make sure when this process goes away, come back. A container in Kubernetes will do it for you because it does, because Kubernetes was designed to manage that for you. It babysits your application and makes sure that what you define is application defined by state. I want 15 of these running, four of these, two of these, one of those, and one of these if this state happens. Great. It just maintains that for you, period, in the story. And that's the core difference, is it's doing all that for you. Whereas the process, you probably have to do it yourself, or have some other extra tool that may not maintain that same um, separation of concerns. So does that, all right, awesome. Uh, other questions? Right here. So the question is, are there any good security tips or controls for Kubernetes? So the first one I would say is number one, be aware of what you're putting in the container. Um, I'm just, I'm going to channel from a, a, a previous speaker that I've heard that's infamous now. When you get into Kubernetes, you'll find this, that running container is downloading from the internet and running it as root. So be mindful of what you're putting in your containers, right? Look for things that have been cryptographically signed, they're controlled. If it's some random person with a thousand downloads, you have no idea who they are, audit it, right? If if there's a if you if you're using a, a main application, does it come from the source? Is it somebody else's port? You don't know. So make sure you're using containers, and that's general container hygiene. That's not limited to Kubernetes, but that is the biggest flaw that I see, and also. Identity. Like, make sure that like you don't need these two. If these two containers need to be together, how do you put them in a pod? Do you separate them? That can be a security concern because when you start adding, well, I'm going to have them separate and talk to each other. How are they talking to each other? Again, this goes back. A lot of this stuff, the cloud sounds different, but it's not. It's if I have two different virtual machines or even two physical machines, how do I tell them to talk to each other? Do I encrypt it? How do they talk? How do I share the secrets? Kubernetes actually has a built-in secrets mechanism, so you can, you know, just go through that. Um, kind of like if you, if you, any Ansible users in the room? One, two, okay. Most of the orchestration tools and the platform tools are really coming to this idea of secrets and vaults, where you can store stuff away and keep it encrypted. So that's the thing, like don't put passwords in files, don't put passwords in fig maps. In, in, in Kubernetes, with containers, you can write config maps, which basically write scripts in to, to the container. Don't put your passwords in there. Just don't. And I know I say that, and knowing full well that there have been a few breaches where the whole point was somebody put the password in plain text and open your repo for the container, and uh, well, now the whole world can see. Why don't we get hacked? The biggest thing in security. I'll leave it there. So, right, so your basic, the, the biggest thing in security is never the software. It's up here, right? Nope. Human, it, it, uh, Kevin nope. Mitnick proved this in a shadow of a doubt with no, commu no computer connection, no internet, and wire, an infamously wire transferred himself, I think, a million bucks. When a bank is there, he said, well, am I secure? Well, you have, I can prove it, and get a million dollars. The guy said, well, you haven't got in. He's like, well, you already paid me. So security starts with us, right? But those are the biggest tips. Keep your wits about you. Treat it like you would any other system. And again, I can't stress it enough. Container hygiene, container hygiene. If you haven't heard me say it, container hygiene. Know where your containers come from. Know what you're putting in your containers and keep track of it. Because the whole point of containers is that you have a single dedicated image. It's a source of truth. And if you do any kind of an auditing for, uh, like say, SOX or PCI, DC, DCSS, or, oh, I forget all the different. It's an acronym suit, and I just assist with it. I am not a specialist on that side, okay? But if you do that kind of compliance auditing, 
containers are great because you can say we signed it, we sealed it, we certified that this is safe and it's reproducible everywhere. You are not deploying a machine, running a script, running you know, uh, an orchestration tool, or an identity. It's locked, sealed. You cryptographically sign your container and you always know it's changed because the checksum will change unless something changed it. I know I harp on that. Right. And that's the biggest thing is to be aware of that. I know I harp on that, but I cannot tell you how many horror stories on the various places I've worked where it all came down to, did you know what you were putting on your server? And the answer is no, no I didn't. Right? So, and that's, you know, it's just part of the course. Uh, other questions? I saw another hand over here. Right back here. Sure, so the question is, I mentioned context and namespaces earlier, and can I elaborate on that and how to use them? So, in the world of Kubernetes, you are always dealing with a cluster, and a cluster is a description of, you know, you have a control node and some, they call them minion nodes, things that do the work, contain the pods, which is, again, the pod is a small suite of work. So, so, each one of those clusters to cube control is a context. So I am working in the context of my cluster. Now in my case, everything I do at GitLab, I'm working mostly through, through uh, GKE, which is Google's cloud environment. I've also dealt with EKS, which is Amazon's cloud environment. I've also dealt with Minikube just locally. And we're, you know, I'm starting to play with K3S, which is scaled down. But all of these are contexts that Cube Control can talk to. And each one of these individual clusters, in the case of GKE and Google, I've got I've had up to five because we have a, a weekly broadcast at Cloud Native Demo where we demo all of our work for the week. If I'm demoing that, I'll have that up. I have my testing cluster for issues I'm working on from customers. I have the cluster that's just, can I break it? What things can I find that I'd like to see, right? Because you know, customer zero. So that kind of thing. But I have to switch all that switching context, which is really to say I'm switching between clusters. So when I say switching context, just think switching cluster, and that'll carry you through. Now, namespacing. Now, for the most part, I don't use very many multiple namespaces very often. Inside of a cluster, you can have different namespaces. There's a system namespace always, and then your, uh, your generic, like your open public namespace. But let's say you want to install the same application in two different namespaces, multi tenant. You can do that. Put one over here, put one over there. Uh, I think there is some mess to that. I have not gone deep into that myself. Mostly when I'm doing namespaces, it's here's an operator sitting over here. Uh, the operator pattern is basically think of it like an operator that's just sitting there, hey, hey, I'm going to make your cluster run. I'm going to turn up pod, turn them down automatically. Uh, we have that in the current cloud native chart for GitLab, right? But you can move that into its own space, it's back into the main space as well. So these are all things you can do. You can separate concerns. So for example, let's see if the internet works. You're not connected. I'm not connected. There's a wire on the floor right here. Oh, I'm on Wi-Fi. I only have USB-C ports, so uh, regular cables don't work on me. Let's see here. Can I pull this over? Not when that's fully up. So, let me see. Am I on the green? Yes. All right. It's always hard to do that from the side. I never developed that superpower of being able to look at things from the side of the screen. So, so we look at this, and again, you can see where I was looking at different items. So let's. Put the microphone down. I apologize to folks viewing remotely if this makes your uh, your microphones pop. So these are all the clusters that I currently can connect to. That's with kubectx, and these are all of my contexts. And then when I want to look at cube namespace. Public, default, and cube system. 
And you can add more. I could, I could have installed my GitLab application into a private main space if I wanted. I usually don't because it's not worth the effort because I'm just installing that to my cluster and then tearing it down about two hours later because I'm doing very limited work. But namespaces allow you to segment that. So let's just say you have multiple applications. You can have your GitLab over here, your WordPress blog over there, and you can have them all in the same cluster, provided your cluster has enough resources to create enough pods to do that. Again, resourcing is key to that. But you can do it, and they do that just so that you don't have to have, you know, could you imagine if you have four or five applications running, and you went, show me the running pods, and you got everything, which, you know, That's all the pods just for GitLab. That's all I have running, and you can see it kind of scrolls off the screen. There's a good number of them. So that is why we have namespaces, so that if you have multiple applications, you can separate them out so when you're trying to do diagnostics. Right. And again, this is for if you're running a production cluster for multiple applications. So the question is, that in my SSH example, what is it expecting to connect to? So I'm going to assume here that what you mean is, what is the GitLab process trying to SSH to? And the answer is, it's the Git user using SSH over Git that does do an SSH connection to establish, to then connect, verify the host key, and pull the repository. Just like if you had a key on your local machine, and you said pull, from a repository where you have uh, private access via SSH as opposed to pulling through HTTPS. So it's setting that up. So the fact that it can't, because really uh, pulling Git over SSH is kind of a nice little wrapper around SSH and SSH protocol, can't connect that way. And that's what we're trying to connect to. We're saying connect to that remote repository, and it can't. And that's bad when you're trying to mirror it, right? Because you have to be able to connect. That, that's cool. Other questions? It is not syslog per se, it is stored on the container, so it is ephemeral to the container. So when the container goes away, I think you can look at some previous logs, but not all. Uh, the question was, like, when I look at the log for the container, where does it come from? Um, now, one of those things is you can configure those logs to go places. So if you have, I don't know, um, an Elk instance, which is Elk is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and, and uh, Kibana, or you have Splunk or some other log ingestion tool, you can wire that up to send logs wherever. Again, it's just a cloud operating system. It's, it's the same thing. Wire it up and send it to your monitoring. Uh, GitLab itself has some built-in monitoring, and we keep extending that. So you can actually look with a nice dashboard and see what's going on. So you know, that's, that's basically where those logs come from and go. But you have to be mindful of where they're going, right? Because, again, containers are ephemeral. So if you want to save it, just be aware. And, and the documentation does cover like how to save state, where to put things. So as you're designing your, your cluster and as you're putting together the, again, if you're packaging it with Helm, you can do it with straight up YAML. Um, if you want to do your cluster with straight YAML, more power to you. Um, I have other things to do, like sleep. So, uh, I mean, small things, yes, but a full cluster, no. So, but that is, you know, that is where they go and where they come from. Um, so that, okay. Um, honestly, I have to go look at where it's configured. So, yeah, that's just something that I have not, I have not poked at it, and GitLab puts it all into a nice dashboard, so I don't have to, it's outside my realm of concern, and for those of you who are, who are full-time software engineers, you know that there's plenty of concerns on your plate at all times. So if you don't have to think about it, you don't until it becomes a problem, which is how I basically learned a lot of this stuff, was, right? Because again, 
when you first look at the cloud, it's, it's kind of, it's not that it's scary, it's just different. And learning that it's the same, that's, the whole, that's why I wanted to give this talk. Because learning that it's just the same old stuff makes it so much less threatening and so much more uh, easy to deal with. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, is there a container technology more secure than Docker? And the, I'm, I'm going to kind of hedge my answer here a little bit. So Run C is being written to do more of that. That is a technology coming out from being led up by the same guy that was known as Mr. SC Linux. So he knows a thing or two about being safe and secure. And I have a great deal of respect. His name is Dan Walsh, if you look for his stuff. SC Linux coloring book. There's also the container coloring book, right? Dan knows his stuff. And I have a lot of respect for him. And I learned a lot from him because I was in the same office with him for four years. So he's a, he's a good guy. Um, I'm not going to say that it's more secure because I have not vetted it myself. And that is a big thing. Again, vet your containers. Look at your run times. But it's the cloud. And honestly, um, as fast as we secure things, folks will unsecure them just as fast behind us. So right now, I'm not going to endorse one over the other because, quite frankly, you know, no one has a long enough proven track record. I mean, the we're the using Kubernetes in production, I mean, yes, it's been the hot thing we all talk about for a year, couple years now. But as far as proved out in production, I think the only folks that have really done that are Google because... Kubernetes, from my understanding, is based on Borg, and Borg is how Kuber is basically Kubernetes on a very much larger scale, run at Google, and that was the precursor to the open source Kubernetes project. Okay, and I have not worked there, so I, you know, I just don't have that experience. But that's kind of my answer. I know it's a kind of a cop out, but I'd rather not steer you wrong because, in my mind, all software is fallible for one very good reason. If you're perfect, raise your hand. We write the code. So all software is fallible. And that back to that earlier question, what, what, what tips about security? We're fallible. So just always look at everything with a deep, deep skepticism. And remember that as, as good as it sounds, as much as we talk about stuff and polish it up on stage at conferences, it, it's stuff written by human beings who are inherently fallible. And we've all had that brain dead moment, right? Like last night when for two hours I was trying to go through and just run through the live demo and tore my cluster down and couldn't figure out why. And I forgot to put the secrets in, which let containers talk to each other because the cryptographic keys. I've been doing this forever, and even I forget stuff, right? So that's the thing. Don't be afraid to acknowledge what you don't know. Don't be afraid to make those mistakes. Acknowledge them, own them, move forward, right? And that's really the best security to anybody, transparency, right? Because when you start trying to hide this stuff or say, oh, this is better and get dogmatic about a particular platform, that's, that's when it comes back to get you, right? We, we all do our best, but there's no such thing as a best platform, right? There's no such thing. There are better platforms, but there are no perfect platforms, and we can all learn from each other. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir, right here in the front. So the self-declared antagonistic question, which, by the way, is the most respectful antagonistic question I've ever received, so thank you for being respectful, is this. So given a, a I'm not going to quote all that, but a various laundry list of people who have very good security credentials say that you should never run containers in production, and how do I feel about that? And my response to that is to be similarly quasi-antagonistic, 
The DOD still uses eight and a quarter inch drives for the nuclear arsenal because they don't trust anything else with nuclear arsenal and they've never upgraded. Sometimes you have to be that paranoid. For a lot of things, you don't necessarily have to be. You have to be responsive. And we, you know, any good cook will tell you to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. So we have to make these choices. Now the difference is, are we being mindful of what we're doing? And I think this is a conversation for those of you, if it's your first time, I'll just say this now. These ta our talks are great. The hallway track. Next year when you come back, the hallway track where you'll learn a lot more. Okay? There's a lot more in the hallway too. So if you don't see a talk you really want, talk to people in the hall because it's awesome. But the thing is that the, the software profession in general, we're one of the only professions where you can do it as a hobbyist. Think about like my friend is a licensed civil engineer. He has to have a licensed PE, and when he signs on a dotted line, if he's wrong, people die, right? I'm, I am from the state of Florida, and we had this bridge that collapsed, even though the engineer signed off on it. People died because the engineer made a mistake. When we make mistakes in what we do, you could have banking information lost, personal lives destroyed, savings. So the question is, those security folks are absolutely right, but I think part of that goes back to we need to treat our profession like engineering, but we take the same level of care. And that's one of the things that I really like with where I'm at now, is that we, you know, everyone I collaborate with has that level of care. They're looking to that, because it's important to them. And I think that if we propagate that through the culture of software engineering, it'll get better. But from their perspective, they're absolutely right. I mean, running container production is inherently dangerous but so is everything else in the software world. And the question is, are we willing to figure it out and fix it and have the rigor and the, you know, the, the personal and academic rigor to make it better? Or are we just gonna have folks saying, the sky is falling, it's okay. We have to meet somewhere in the middle because we need things to be run and be able to run at scale. But we also need to satisfy those security concerns. And I think that the community after, let's see, Heartbleed, shell shock. I mean, how many can we talk about, I, I alluded to these earlier, the, the cutesy little problems with their pictures and their web pages. How many of those are we going to have if we take it seriously? That's why the, uh, the Linux Foundation started funding things like OpenSSL, bringing things into the fold. Let's be more rigorous about, because all of open source has that, right? NTP is a single person sitting in their house, not funded. What happens if they decide they're done and want to retire and go fish on a lake somewhere? NTP runs most of the internet, right? I mean, that's an important thing. Keeping time is important. Um, GPS requires it, right? Most of our server systems require it. Banks definitely require it, right? So that question goes deeper than just containers. I would say that's all software. So when we pick on containers, it's because it's the new hotness. But I would say that I would take their rallying cry if it's not safe to run containers in production. It's not safe to run software in production. It's just not, and I'm not saying this, I'm not bashing on our profession, okay? I'm a software, I'm a software developer, an engine, and a software engineer, but we need to take that more rigor and take that on ourselves, right? We need to own it and move it forward, and your friends are absolutely right. And, 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 right, and that's the people leading the charge, trying to educate the rest of the broader software community. And I applaud them, because that, need, that message needs to, be, needs to get out. Yeah, well, and a lot of that has, a lot of that with the advent of name, realize that namespacing containers only came about maybe two years ago, possibly three. That's a really new feature, right? Now think about that. Keeping processes distinct and separate in the kernel. That's really important. And containers didn't get there for the first, you know, eight, nine, ten years of their lives, right? So, and again, this is why I said I have immense respect for Dan Walsh, because he is trying to bring that, you know, because SE Linux was part of secure, you know, mandatory versus direct access. You're, you're talking about access control, access control, and he's the one trying to lead that charge on the container side, get these things secured. What are we doing, right? 
Um, and that's, you know, but we have to do that work. And at the end of the day, you know, you, you pick and choose your own risk. And also there's a risk of not going to market, right? Because if, if you're working at scale and you're running uh, not with Kubernetes, you're, porting around, you're toting around that large thing of scripts. And that really depends on how good are your admins, right? If you have a fleet of people who are educated in security and a fleet of people who know what they're doing, you can do that well. Now, walk into a small to medium-sized business where it's, some, where it's some kid they hired out of college and say, hey, do this thing because we can, we can afford to pay you because you're a new guy or a new girl, right? You're the new person. We can afford to pay you because we just can't afford IT. Kubernetes, if they're trying to scale later, gives you a better shot at those interoperations not being terrible. Not saying it's the best, but, you know, when faced with terrible and really terrible, if written well, that, again, if written well. Um, I do a lot with Ansible. I'm Ansible certified, and I can't tell you how many playbooks I've seen that are just not idempotent. Idempotent means that it's always true, like the state always goes back. Same thing for chef cookbooks. I've been learning chef, and I look out and stuff at the community, and I go, that's up, but that's not idempotent. Now, the evangelists will talk about make sure it's idempotent, but remember, the evangelists and the folks who are, you know, preaching this are not the ones doing the work, and there's not enough education out there. This is one of the big reasons why I'm an advocate for this conference. It's a free, open conference where you can come and learn these skills. So if your employer is just not paying for you to go learn this stuff, you can come here and learn it from folks that do it at the highest levels for free, right? And I think that's another thing, again, I'm probably getting preachy, but that's a big thing in open source. The power of open source is that we can educate people and bring them up to that level. And yes, those orchestration tools do a lot, but you, the orchestration tool is only as the good as the person that's orchestrating, right? And that's why, you know, one Philharmonic is better than the other, or one rendition of a song. Like my, I, I used to be a music major, so you know, I love stuff orchestrated by Rimsky Korsakoff, even if he didn't write it, because he has a good, he, I like his taste. I also have his book on orchestration. But then there are other folks that will orchestrate, and you go, did you listen to the original song? Like, you know, can I score the orchestra? What were you thinking? We see the same thing with orchestration tools, where, they, where it doesn't save you. Nothing saves you from a lack of understanding the process, the security aspect, what's going on. So again, I'm not trying to be combative here, but again, right, it's, it's that, like, to say that containers are bad assumes that everyone can do the other process perfectly well, and I would say 90% of the time, it doesn't. And it's not through malicious action. It's through lack of education, because this isn't taught, right? The biggest thing I've ever seen is people walk in, they go, I'm fresh out of college, and here's what I'm going to do. Do you know how to use Git? No. Do you know how to write maintainable code that can be maintained by 15 other people, or a thousand, or a million, right? I mean, how many open source contributors are out there? No. We're not teaching it in school, right? Some schools do. I, I've, I've seen a couple of folks that have come through as interns when I've mentored that did get that teaching in school. But by, by far and large, it is not the norm. So we need to make that the norm, and we do that through community, you know, community involvement, right? And this is why, like, uh, on GitLab, we take community contributions all the time. And one of the things that we do is we actually go through and give meaningful feedback. Because if you're going to join our community, we want you to have meaningful feedback, because why would you join a community where it's just like, ah, whatever, right? You want to be engaged. And I think that all of open source needs to get better at that, and we'll get a better, we'll have less of the security folks sitting there going, what are they doing? Why are they doing that, right? I can't imagine how many. Actually, I can. I've got a couple of security friends that are DOD level jobs, and every time they look at stuff, they just want, it makes them go drink. Because it's just, what were people thinking? So, and security is a big deal. Like security is all of our responsibility. So if, you, if, you're, if you're just getting started, if you have a security operations team, and they say, do this, don't get mad at them. Ask them, hey, can you tell me, explain to me what's going on and why, like, what should I be looking for? Learn the why. And then they'll stop bothering you because you'll see it before they tell you. And you'll also become a better asset to wherever project you're in. Right? So I'm going to get off my soapbox because I'm, I'm kind of a security nerd too. So, you know, uh, question here. And I think we have four minutes. I'm just going to time box that so we know. Go ahead.
Yep. So the comment here is that there's a great presentation by Dan Walsh that containers don't contain. And it's getting better, but it's still true, right? Th this is why that's, I mean, his full-time job is working on containers, Project Atomic security, right? There are cadres of people across the container and Kubernetes ecosystem who are so, whose sole job is make this better, right? Because, I mean, we, I think we just had one. I don't remember what cutesy name it got, but we just had one for Kubernetes, a, a security issue. And basically, nobody wants to have their favorite project splayed all over the internet and shown, hey, look, this thing is full of holes. Go use this proprietary thing instead. Right? No, never made no mind that it's a big black box that, you know, it's a clock ticker and it's, and, and it's a radioactive isotope inside ticking away. If you've never seen that talk, look for um, uh, open versus closed source and the atomic black box. It's a great talk and it's really scary when you think about, you know, you know, kind of what goes on between open source versus proprietary software and the illusion of security through obscurity, right? It is, it is an illusion and we lie to ourselves all the time. So, uh, other questions? I feel like this side of the room has been very active. We've got time for one more. Anybody over here? Okay, well with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much for attending. If it's your first time, enjoy the Linux Fest. If you, if you think of something later, run me down the hall. I'm more than open to questions, as is everybody else here. Have a great rest of the conference. Enjoy yourself and stay safe.